to go, Michael? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Michael and I work with Inside Pact and I will be ensuring that you have a smooth experience with Zoom today. I was just starting the YouTube live stream, which should in a second also start in the RBHR Room 2 YouTube page. Welcome to today's webinar um, with the title Harnessing the Power of National Human Rights Institutions in Facilitating Access to Effective Remedy. Our panelists are very excited to be sharing their thoughts with you today. And after the panelists speak, there will be a Q&A session. During that time, please send your questions into the Q&A window, which you can open by clicking the button that says Q&A on the bottom of your screen. The moderator will be looking at the questions submitted here. Please feel free to use um, this option. Um, and now I will be uh, giving the floor to the moderator and please also note that this meeting will be recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Surya Dev. I'm a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. And I will be moderating this session on harnessing the power of national human rights institutions in facilitating, facilitating access to effective remedy. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you, including all the panelists uh, joining from different places, different countries, and also thank uh, all the uh, participants, audience in different places joining this particular webinar. As you may know, uh, business respect for human rights is uh, a key component of UN guiding principles and uh, to respect human rights, UN guiding principles expect companies to do three main things. First, they have to make a policy commitment uh, at the highest level to respect human rights. Then they have to do uh, regular ongoing human rights due diligence. And as we uh, listen in the morning, there is uh, a growing demand or appetite for mandatory human rights due diligence. And the third component is access to remedy. Uh, which is part of principle 22 of second pillar and access to remedy is also part of pillar three. Pillar three, in fact, is all, only about access to remedy. Now, when it comes to access to remedy, uh, the guiding principles uh, contemplate uh, three broad types of mechanism. And one of those mechanism is non-judicial uh, mechanism. And national human rights institutions, NHRIs, are one of those critical non-judicial institutions. And that is the context within which uh, this webinar is taking place. So we're going to look at uh, the role of uh, uh, the NHRIs in the, in the context of uh, access to, facilitating access to effective remedy. And we are using the word facilitate in a broad sense. Uh, in the direct narrow sense, NHRIs can accept complaints and then they can, they can provide remedies on their own in the forms of compensation. They can stop a particular project. They can re request a company to hire a worker back who has been dismissed uh, on an unfair ground. So these could be the direct remedial possibilities. But NHRIs can also provide remedies indirectly in a wider sense. That is, they can raise awareness about human rights. They can build capacity. They can conduct uh, inquiries, uh, they can build capacity, they can provide legal aid, and they can also refer cases to courts or other non-judicial mechanisms. So in this session, we will like to focus on all these possibilities. I should also mention that uh, the UN Working Group is currently writing a report on this precise theme. Uh, we started this project last year. And uh, this report will also make recommendations to uh, all NHRIs all over the world that what they can do better to facilitate access to effective remedy. So with these uh, brief introductory remarks, uh, let me introduce uh, the uh, very distinguished group of panelists uh, who are joining us. So we have with us uh, Her Excellency Professor Amara Pongasapich. Uh, she is a Thailand government representative to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. And she's also a professor of law at uh, Chualokongorn University. Then we have Ms. Mona Ansari. She is a commissioner member of the National Human Rights Commission, Nepal. Then we have Mr. Hamad Tofan uh, Dominic, and he's a chairperson of National 
Commission on Human Rights Indonesia, we also known as uh, Comnes Ham. Then we have with us uh, Dr. Kamal Uddin Ahmed. Uh, he is a commissioner, full-time member of the National Human Rights Commission of Bangladesh. Uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Andy Hall, who is a former international affairs advisor to Migrant Workers' Rights Network and is currently working as an independent um, activist to working on the migrant workers' rights and currently based in Kathmandu, I understand. So uh, that is the brief introduction. And with this brief introduction, um, I would also like to uh, quickly mention uh, about how we're going to run this session. So I have a number of questions that I'm going to pose to the panelists in two rounds. Uh, so I will go first round. And after all the five panelists are able to share their thoughts on the first round of questions, I will pick some questions from the virtual floor. So please use your Q&A tab and type your questions. And then I'm going to read those questions. Uh, and you can ask your questions to a specific panelist, or you may uh, ask in open question journal to anyone. And then I will have a second round of questions. And hopefully there is enough time. Then we'll also have some questions in the second round from the audience. We also have a short video, uh, but I will uh, introduce that video a uh, little later. So let us uh, start with this context. Uh, and I would like to start with uh, Mr. Tofan first. Uh, Mr. Tofan, uh, I would like you to share uh, the experience of Indonesian Human Rights Commission on two questions. First is whether your commission has an explicit or implicit mandate to accept complaints for human rights abuses by businesses, private companies, not merely state-owned companies, but private corporations. And uh, if you have that mandate, can you provide one or two examples of how your NHRI has been able to provide effective remedy to the victims in those cases? You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Soya, and also thank you for organizing uh, all panelists. Good afternoon, everybody and also the participant of webinar. Uh, 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 we have an article on human rights in our constitution, and mainly uh, uh, the mandate is based on our national law on human rights, which is also uh, discussing, uh, mentioning about the function of uh, National Commission of Human Rights, and also some other instrument, national instrument and international instrument already ratified and accommodated to our national law. Uh, regarding to the issue of human rights. And of course, uh, some other specific issue like disabled par uh, persons, uh, elimination of uh, uh, discrimination and something else. Yeah. Uh, every year, we have thousands uh, of complaints coming to our, uh, our commission. And until now, uh, complaint for a business is the second largest number of uh, complaints after the police. Police, for instance, in uh, last year, we have 1,670 cases, and but business, uh, we have uh, 1,021 uh, cases. Local government is the third, 682 uh, cases. But uh, cases uh, going to police and also local government, some of them are also related to the issue of business and human rights. Uh, type of the cases is land dispute, so agrarian conflict employment, uh, manpower dispute, wages, and, and also environmental uh, pollution, sometimes also uh, uh, relating to the indigenous people rights. Type of uh, business who are always complain, for instance, plantations, because Indonesia is have uh, uh, a big plantation here, forestry, extractive industries, mining, coal, oil, and gas, manufacture, and also construction, uh, uh, especially infrastructure uh, construction. So how uh, my commission uh, dealing with these complaints. There are some methods that we have. One is uh, according to the national law on human rights. Our function is to do monitoring investigation if the complaint come to uh, my office. So we can invite or call uh, uh, certain parties to, to be interviewed, to be asked, clarification, information from all parties, and after that we sum, sum up, uh, come up with the recommendation study and research for certain issues. Like last year, we have a certain uh, 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 special uh, study on mining, and we invite all parties to give input, including CSOs and also uh, uh, the victims. Yeah. And the third is public consultation. 
uh, last year for instance uh, regarding the the the, the, the problem of uh, infrastructure uh, highway uh, all in, in all uh, indonesia yeah? uh, there are some complaints come to my office and then we have a, we organize a kind of public consultation we invite all the parties including the victim to sit together to find a solution on that and another another way is to draft uh, a national action plan but uh, our national action plan i mean initiated by our our commissions submitted to government because they are the focal point under the coordinating ministry of economic then and now they are starting to put it in in uh, national action plan of human rights uh, this national action plan become the guideline also a standard of human rights how business do, uh, do something in indonesia and the last but not least i think uh, is uh, mediation this is a special uh, method that we have based on our national law we can set up a, a mediation reconciliation or negotiation by inviting all parties to sit together in our office or in another place to uh, get a solution one big case last year that we uh, 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 more or less success to to to, to solve the problem is uh, the the big uh, uh, project of international airport of Yogyakarta. for several years there is conflict between people and uh, the constructions owner and government, local government but uh, we do something for by, by uh, starting from the investigation and after that inviting uh, uh, several parties in uh, different uh, meeting and after that all parties in one big meeting and find a solution like a compensation relocation and something else i think it's more or less we have uh, some stories uh, not only a big project but also sometimes uh, individual complaint one one uh, workers for instance come to my office and asking us to mediate uh, he or she uh, with uh, uh, his or her uh, company and we invite all parties to sit together uh, that's uh, 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 more or less experience from indonesia but of course there are uh, something Thank that uh, we can we can uh, improve after uh, uh, especially if we discuss a uh, letter on about the uh, legal aspect of uh, uh, solving the problem of uh, business and human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you for sharing a concrete example. I would like to now move to uh, Mona. And uh, again, my question is that uh, whether the uh, Nepalese Human Rights Commission has an explicit or implicit mandate to deal with the uh, company business related human rights abuses. And if you can share any concrete examples where you have tried to provide remedies, you have the floor, Mona. Thank you, Surya, and it's a pleasure. Good afternoon to all of you from Kathmandu. Hope you all are safe and uh, uh, good doing in this uh, critical time of uh, pandemic. Uh, National Human Rights Commission of Nepal has an explicit constitutional mandate uh, uh, for protection and promotion of human rights. Uh, constitutional mandate for, uh, as Human Rights Commission, including uh, civil and political right, economic and cultural right, as well as right, uh, uh, rights, uh, the other group. We have the mandate to receive a complaint, conduct investigation and make a recommendation for remedies. This is a very special mandate which a Human Rights Commission of Nepal hold. We have exercised our mandate in monitoring of human rights abuses by the business uh, companies and uh, made our recommendations uh, to the government to take a necessary step. The NHRC Nepal does this coordination with the civil society, government, business companies, uh, the affected com communities and people. Uh, however, our mandate uh, doesn't extend it to the cases which are under the court. This is a, a court proce uh, procedure. Uh, in a recent year, we have received uh, several complaints uh, related with the human rights violation by the business companies. In most cases, this violation took a place uh, by the government projects uh, of uh, irrigation, uh, hydropower projects, ro road extension, airport construction, etc. The uh, same complaints, uh, same complaint have uh, come uh, from the private sector industries, such as uh, cement factories. As uh, you know, Nepal uh, holds a very strong desire for a development. So 
this is also one of the major um, area. In 2018 and 2019, NHRC held a stakeholder consultation uh, on the business and human rights. During this consultation, it was found that the land encroachment, non-consultation with the affected communities, uh, delayed or unfair, unfair compensation payment and unawareness about the business-related human rights uh, were some, some of the main problems. It is uh, estimated uh, that uh, over 150 uh, thousand people have been displaced recent year by the business and development projects. Uh, these people live in Kathmandu and other, other districts uh, as an IDPs. It is also observed that the business related human rights violation has a more uh, uh, severe effect on vulnerable groups, especially women, children, Dalit, and um, uh, indigenous people in Nepal. The indigenous community communities have shown deep concern on the encroachment uh, of their cultural heritage area by the business activities. Uh, and uh, this is a very sad part, non-response by the government authorities. In many of these com uh, complaints, NHRC has conducted investigation and provide recommendation to talk about the, one of the specific case where our intervention was um, effective. And uh, I think uh, earlier also in um, another, uh, I mean, to a previous session, I, I shared this one, but uh, this is very important. When the hydropower project have started, uh, Kinti and Dalkebar project is a 220 kV transmission grid. Uh, this case was uh, settled in uh, 2018, and the grid extension uh, was uh, like uh, more than uh, 250 or nearby 300 family were displaced. And uh, they were doing the protest against the power extension line. They submitted their complaint to NHRC for remedies and settlement. This is our success case because we, we effectively facilitated for the remedies and peaceful settlement, which is, uh, I mean, they, they have like a three demand and uh, we, we, we able to engage three uh, main concerned people like community, government and NHRC. So their major demand is uh, land, uh, land uh, resettlement, remedy converted into the money according to market price. And third was the, uh, the project must be built at the local community buildings. So this is, um, uh, this is our success story. Despite of um, uh, effective engagement among these some, uh, some there were some of the, some of people were very unhappy against this settlement. So I think, uh, uh, this is uh, like one of the, in fact, uh, in the Nepali context, uh, we have like some other cases also, we have uh, settled like a poultry farming and uh, some- Probably we'll, yeah. we'll come to the, those cases sure, later. Sure. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. Uh, no, sorry to uh, cut you short, but, but I think that was useful to set the scene about the Nepal. And I'm already getting some interesting questions and I'm sure uh, there'll be questions which allow you to explain further. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Kamal uh, and if you can share about the uh, National Human Rights Commission of Bangladesh, uh, whether you have the explicit or implicit mandate and uh, also any, any cases where you have been successful in providing effective remedies. Uh, Dr. Kamal, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deva. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to uh, express my deep condolence to those who passed away because of COVID. COVID-19 has a likely impact on economies of all countries, backed heavily by business sector. We expect a fairer and rights-based human situation in the business sector, especially at the post-COVID world. And uh, to tell about the first question that has been made, I'd like to say that 
uh, it is straight where it is yes. Of course, we have uh, a specific mandate, explicit and implicit, uh, to accept complaints for human rights abuses of, by business. And I would also say that uh, the possibilities that uh, Mr. Surya has mentioned at the beginning, we do have all those as our mandates in addressing the uh, complaints in the business sector. And about effective remedy, I will be giving example later. Uh, and uh, just to tell about the business uh, and the human rights violations, I mean, Asia Pacific region has embraced economic dynamism. Bangladesh is also making progress in accelerating economic development, resulting in increased incomes, new industries and domestic markets are there. Despite progress made in several fronts, Bangladesh continues to face common challenges concerning business related human rights abuses. I can mention some of them are unsafe working condition, um, low wages, child labor, forced labor, environmental pollution, and at times forced land acquisition. Bangladesh NHRI, that means National Human Rights in, uh, Commission of Bangladesh, by virtue of its uh, Act 2009, Section 12, has the mandate to inquire Suomoto or on a petition presented to it by a person affected or any person on his behalf into any allegation of violation of human rights or abetment thereof by a person, any state owned, any government agency or institution or non-government organization. And National Human Rights Commission Bangladesh is mandated to handle allegations of human rights violations, including in the field of trade and commerce, inquire onto it and recommend the government to, uh, to take appropriate initiative proceedings for prosecution or to take any action. The commission can take measures to resolve uh, through mediation and conciliation, submit a petition on behalf of the aggrieved person before the high court division, recommend the government or the concerned authority to sanction a temporary grant to the affected person or his her family, expanding its collaboration with judicial and quasi-judicial Remaining, uh, remedy, remedial measure mechanisms that is courts, labor, uh, labor, court, labor tribunals. And we have some normative frameworks specifically about signing of the international uh, treaties and the supported by our constitution. Bangladesh labor law is a supporter. The Environmental Conservation Act 1995 is also there. Access to remedy. Uh, there we can say access to remedy has both procedural and substantive aspects. State-based grievance mechanisms may involve a, a breach uh, uh, for the branch and agency of the state or by an independent body on a statutory or constitutional basis. State-based non-judicial grievance mechanism also play an essential role in comp uh, complementing and supplementing judicial mechanisms. National human rights uh, commission in Bangladesh can play important role in this regard. I can say that we have ready-made garment sector in Bangladesh, which is very, uh, quite thriving. Uh, I can say the topmost one in the whole world or the second position right th at the moment. The sector accounts for 81% of the total export earning and provides employment to around 4.2 million people of Bangladesh. And we have received number of complaints from different uh, business sector like jobs, salary, allowance, uh, different related complaints. There were 67 complaints in the in last year, hospital medical treatment related complaints, six discrimination, two. And we also looked at Suomoto cases, job, salary related case, hospital treatment compl uh, complaints. Um, those were the things that we in fact have been looking after. And those were very successfully looked after by National Human Rights Commission of Bangladesh. Um, I can give you an example of Bangladesh Commission that has been quite effective in addressing violation, violations committed by private sector. Uh, National Human Rights Commission Bangladesh inquired into a complaint from the tea garden workers in Habigans district for non-payment of wages for extended period of time. Closure of the tea garden hospital closure for more than seven months, it really created a havoc in the whole garden. 416 workers were working in the tea garden, which was closed by the owner in May 2016 without the payment of 24 months provident fund. Um, they approached the National Human Rights Commission, Bangladesh, Bangladesh National Human Rights Commission, pay, 
full attention to it with support of the district uh, deputy commissioner office met the owner of the tea garden mediated the dispute and persuaded the owner to pay the outstanding wages rations and the provident fund to run national human rights commission also instructed to run the hospital for the tea garden workers and provide them with needed medical facilities it was also recommended to repair the roads of the tea garden area and ultimately all of them were performed so that's all right about uh, the uh, example. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamal, that's much appreciated. And now I would like to, uh, we have heard uh, interventions from three NHRIs. Now I would like to move on to the users of the system, people who have approached NHRIs to seek access to remedy. And we have one such user in the panel, but I would also encourage others in the audience if you have tried to use NHRIs in the past, anywhere in Asia Pacific or even outside, and you would like to share your experience, please use Q&A tab at the end of the screen and post your question or comment. But before I do that, I will invite Andy now. Now, Andy, uh, earlier you were based in Thailand, and uh, I understand you and some other CSOs uh, did try to use the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand uh, in different cases, but in particular, one case dealing with the uh, the uh, poultry farm, you know, uh, the thermic acid case. So can you describe your experience? Uh, what were your expectations from the commission? Uh, what was your experience? And did you get what you wanted uh, as a civil society actor? Thank you, you have the floor. Okay, thank you for the namaste, uh, Swati Krab, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today uh, from Nepal. Uh, I would like to just give a very brief introduction that, uh, you know, as a, somebody who is a strong advocate, um, I've often used so many different approaches that start with uh, individual cases, individual companies, engaging them, moving up to business associations, uh, filing cases in the court, uh, engaging officials, using official complaint mechanisms, uh, escalating to buyers, uh, supply chain actors, investors, uh, unions, NGOs, and then finally uh, using the media when all of these uh, approaches have not been successful. And so the National Human Rights Commission is one of those uh, tools that we can use as activists um, to, to try to reach the goal of uh, ensuring human rights for those who are most needy. So uh, I was in Thailand since 2005, and at the beginning, I used the National Human Rights Commission mechanisms of, in Thailand. Uh, in many cases, started with uh, non-discrimination related to motorbike uh, licenses and uh, workplace compensation. I used it in the Gotao murder case related to forensic issues very successfully. Uh, I've tried to use it in Malaysia related to gloves, which wasn't so successful at the moment. And um, I used it again in 2016 in the Tamagaset case. So just to give a very brief introduction of Tamagaset case, it was a case of uh, alleged forced labor. Uh, workers were claiming to have worked 20 hours a day, had their passports confiscated, they didn't have any leave, they were underpaid, they didn't have freedom of movement, this was the claim. Uh, they brought time cards to the officials to complain that they were working 20 hours a day and they were prosecuted, uh, they were arrested, two of them were arrested and, and placed in detention on the basis that they'd stole the time cards from their employer. And this Tamagaset case has led to 37 complaints against 22 human rights defenders in the civil and criminal court in Thailand against journalists, against researchers, workers, uh, activists, NGOs, even National Human Rights Commissioners. And it's now a, a world famous case, I think, in, in terms of slap cases. Uh, all of the cases have been dismissed apart from one shock judgment against a journalist who was uh, sentenced to two years uh, for reporting on the case, two years in prison. She was uh, sentenced and, and she's currently appealing the case. Uh, this case, uh, it was quite a difficult case, a very sensitive case. It was related to business and human rights, and we petitioned the National Human Rights Commission. I was the former international affairs advisor for the Migrant Worker Rights Network, and I decided with the team to, to petition the National Human Rights Commission, and it was assigned to the Economic and Social and Cultural Rights uh, Committee. The investigation was very challenged. Uh, the National Human Rights Commission, according to our knowledge, they didn't do any on the ground investigation. Uh, they didn't call, um, they didn't go to the, to the place uh, where the actual offense happened. The investigation was very brief and there were many issues related to translation. This was migrant workers, very vulnerable migrant workers who were making a complaint uh, in the National Human Rights Commission, a very lofty building in, in, in Bangkok. And uh, the way the investigation was carried out was, was, uh, was challenged 
challenging. Uh, the findings, uh, they basically said, yes, there's wage violations. Yes, there was uh, uh, working hour violations, but they said there was no forced labor. They said the, the fence at the farm was uh, not high enough to prevent someone from running away. They said some of the workers had returned to Myanmar in the past, therefore they weren't forced labor victims, they had freedom of movement. Um, they said that you know this was a case where there was no forced labor. They used a definition of physical forced labor, not a definition of uh, mental coercion or, or, or such under international law. Um, they made recommendations to the government related to the good labor practices program, uh, said that there should be a uh, offense of uh, passport confiscation, there should be law reform. They said that the government, the, co the government should prioritize the UN guiding principles on business human rights and also make amendments to the law. The report itself uh, was actually sent to uh, one of the big companies in Thailand in advance of actually being released to the defendants, uh, the, the workers, on the day that they launched a criminal prosecution against the company claiming about 6 million baht. So the report was actually given to the companies involved in the case before it was actually given to the workers. As a result of this, the, the report of the National Human Rights Commission, which I as an individual and, and many people feel to be uh, not in compliance with international standards, was used in the litigation against the, the 14 farm workers who were prosecuted. As I say, there's been 37 complaints against 22 human rights defenders. It was cited at court. Uh, the National Human Rights Commission uh, sent only very junior officials to give testimony at the court. The National Human Rights Commission did not make any official statements on the case, um, despite the fact that their report was used against the people who were petitioning. And I myself was involved in negotiations with the National Human Rights Commission in Geneva um, during the Business Human Rights Conference, which was not really very successful. So this was a case really where the victims in this case, the workers who were subject to forced labor, were not protected by the National Human Rights Commission and the National Human Rights Commission mechanisms were actually used against them and 37 complaints against 22 human rights defenders have been, have been um, prosecuted um, partially as a result of a, an inadequate report by Thailand's National Human Rights Commission. So whereas the National Human Rights Commission may have done very good work in some areas related to sugar cane, related to land confiscation, related to discrimination, this case was not a positive case. Thanks, Andy. And, and we'll come back to you later uh, in, in terms of what lessons we can draw from this case and uh, your experience with that. Now, let me move on to the final panelist, uh, Professor Amara. and. Uh, uh, you are part of this IHR uh, and which can be described as perhaps a regional NHRI. So what role do you see for IHR to, uh, in this idea of providing access to remedy? If not taking complaints, can you at least promote the idea of facilitating access to remedy in the wider sense, especially in cases which are transborder in nature? Because many cases may involve a company from one country operating in another country. So in those cases which are transnational or transborder in nature, what role do you see for IHR or anything else you would like to share? You have the floor, Amara. Thank you, Surya. Um, I, I was wondering whether you want me to defend uh, Andy's remarks uh, on behalf of the Thai in HRI. No, but, no, no, I think uh, th that role I can give to anyone who is listening and if there's anyone else. So I think you don't need to defend them. But of course, no. if you want to say anything, I, I most welcome that. No, 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 I prefer not. Okay. Uh, and since you uh, give me the <clears throat> question regarding ICHA, and yeah. at the moment I'm ICHA, which is a regional human rights body consisting of 10 ASEAN member countries. Uh, before going on, I must uh, emphasize here that ASEAN with 10 countries uh, put emphasis on two principles, ASEAN principles. One is non-interference and the other one is consensus decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So with those two principles, it makes it very difficult to work um, because you need to have 10 um, members to agree with you. So in answering the question of national NHRI, whether there is a mm -hmm. mandate to provide remedy or protect human rights for the people, uh, with these two ASEAN principles, it's, uh, it turned out that there is a mandate 
I can mandate for protect and respect human rights, but there is no mechanism for protection mm -hmm. for ICHA. So mm -hmm. that's one difficult angle. Another is that the ASEAN Charter, which came out in 2007, separate activities into three separate pillars or communities. One, political security. Second, economic. Third, social, cultural. And AICHA belong to political and security community. And again, they work in pillars. So it was difficult to talk about business and human rights because that belonged to the economic pillar. But fortunately, um, ASEAN realized the problems and with the ASEAN 2025 vision, it was agreed that from now on, we will work cross-sectorally and cross-pillar. So, and AICHA is the overarching body to do that. So now, uh, there are room to maneuver and we can integrate or work with people in other sectors. That's one dimension. The other dimension is that the UN guiding principles, especially the session on access to remedy, focus on the role of the states and the role of business, but no, no mention of regional bodies. So, uh, we at a regional commission tend to follow the national uh, commission and many of us would uh, follow the Paris principle of NHRIs. So that's the way we will do the work. Um, for ASEAN region, I have two points, two, two sets of uh, human rights violations. The first one being the construction of large infrastructure impacting on people in neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you asked me to talk about cross-border issues. Yes, yeah? thank you. So, so for large infrastructure, uh, there are now uh, cross-border issues. For example, when you talk about dam construction, you find that it is the dam, the dam is located in one country impacting on local people. The contractor comes from another country and the investors are multinationals. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of large agriculture plantation, similarly, the location is in one country impacting on local people. Contractor came maybe locally or sometimes from outside and investors are usually multinationals or two countries. So with this kind of problem, it is very, it's suitable for AICHA to take responsibility. Yeah. But because of the non-interference uh, principle, it, it was very, it has been very difficult. Yes. And, but when I was with the Thai National Human Rights Institute, we have tried to overcome that by each NHRI working in with the, their own nationals, collaborating with another NHRIs in the neighboring country, or collaborating with CSOs in another country. So that's how we will have to maneuver ourselves if we want to do uh, remedy or yeah. or protection. Yeah. We, we will um, call it this innovation. You're calling it maneuvering. So that's innovative approach to to extend the mandate and be creative to provide remedies, right? Right. Uh, Amara, can I? Do you have something more to say, or can I? The other issue is on the labor-related issue, which is connected closely with. Okay. Can uh, you please quickly wind up? Thank you. Yes. In terms of labor-related issues, the difficulty with AICHA or ASEAN is that not all member states ratify the same human rights convention. Mm -hmm. Not all member states ratify the same ILO conventions. Member states are not are at, are at different level of development stages. So it has been very, very difficult for the 10 ASEAN member states to agree on labor issues, such as minimum wage, 
basic rights to education and health, social security, provident fund, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that difficulty, uh, we are now still struggling. And for ASEAN, we have had the ASEAN Charter in 2007, and it took them 10 years to try to draft the ASEAN Commission on Migrant Workers. And we did not get a, a perfect or a good uh, draft. Now, in 2017, ASEAN agreed not to include family members of migrant workers into this draft uh, compared to the International uh, Com uh, Convention on Migrant Workers and their families. In 2017, also, ASEAN uh, agreed to set up a commission, a, a committee on migrant workers instead of commission on migrant workers, which shows very clearly that uh, ASEAN can, will still have to debate more. Sure. Um, what happened is we have to do bilateral works. Yes. And Th Thailand signed MOUs with Myanmar with Lao PDR and with uh, Cambodia to deal with the nationality verification scheme. So we still have to go bilaterally uh, instead of regionally. Okay. Thank you, you want me to stop there? And uh, yeah, I think that would be much appreciated because I have a lot of questions coming from the virtual floor. So thank you very much uh, for these first round of interventions, all the panelists. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interest in this webinar. It seems we already have 30 plus questions. Uh, I may not be able to take all the questions, but I will try to take some questions now. Uh, my first set of questions is going to be from, uh, for Tofan, uh, the Indonesian uh, Human Rights Commission. And I have three or four questions for you, and then you can try to answer those questions uh, together, but as briefly as possible so that I take more questions. Uh, One question is that, is the commission only reactive or can you also take cases on your own? That's first question for you. Yeah. Second, uh, second no, let me finish two okay. or three questions, if you don't mind, sorry, <laughs> because that will be more efficient if you just make notes. So first question is active or reactive? Uh, the second question is, what powers does the commission have in if some businesses or anyone do not comply with your recommendations in terms of remedies? You recommend something and companies do not follow them. What, what can you do? The third question is about, uh, mediation can you can you share a little bit about how effective this uh, mediation process has been in terms of holding the private sector accountable so i think i will stop here for now yeah uh, thank you thank you i also see another question about uh, nation action plan i will try okay to... you, you can you can take that as also very good <laughs> yes, thank you thank you uh yeah mostly we just uh, respond the complaint come to uh, our commission, but uh, we can also uh, proactively doing something through the uh, commission of uh, uh, study and research for certain issue. Like I uh, already mentioned uh, last year, we uh, uh, pick, uh, take the issue of uh, mining, yeah? and then uh, proactively we invite all uh, part, uh, all uh, parties to sit together, and then we do a kind of uh, a short research and after that we come up with a recommendation. But mostly we receive complaint and from the complaint, we set up our uh, uh, activities for that, uh, doing uh, uh, investigation for instance, interview, in, uh, in, uh, uh, question, clarification, something else. And uh, regarding the issue of national action plan, we already submitted uh, our initiative this is national action plan should be authorized by the government because they are the, the focal point for business and human rights. But as a human rights commission, we initiated and we submitted in 2017. But now we are waiting for the government to, in, to, to put it in a national action plan of human rights according to uh, uh, the promise of the government. And uh, regard, regarding the issue of uh, migrant workers, yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, our limitation. Uh, based on the national law of human rights, the function of Komasam in doing investigation and monitoring, it uh, should be in uh, our our country. So we cannot do uh, monitoring to go going abroad, for instance. So that's why 
for one issue in Sabah yeah, uh, of Indonesian workers, uh, Indonesian citizens in Sabah, we have a MOU with Suhaka, National Commission of Human Rights of Malaysia. So we uh, use uh, this uh, memorandum of understanding to uh, protect our uh, Indonesian workers in Sabah, uh, Sarawak, yeah? and then we will continue to, uh, to, I mean, to expand this uh, kind of uh, similar MOU to the uh, peninsula because there are also many Indonesians working there. But we cannot directly monitor uh, doing investigation, which is out of our mandate. Different from the uh, mandate of uh, study or research, we can do out uh, abroad. Uh, now, we uh, about uh, uh, compliance, yeah. Uh, that's that's the the hot. I mean, the the serious issue. The degree of compliance from the you the from the business or companies in Asia is not very uh, very strong. Mm -hmm. Even though they are the second largest largest, largest uh, complaint by the public, that's the the, the 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 hot issue. That's why we uh, uh, lobby the government and also to lobby the. Uh, the association of business, yeah, in order to uh, come up with such uh, such, uh, such 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 of uh, agreement uh, of uh, a kind of uh, uh, common platform on human rights issue. That so everybody can can be reviewed uh, annually or maybe uh, be annually, and then after that we. Uh, hope that they will uh, improve their uh, compliance on uh, business and human rights issues. And uh, one specific, specific issue on gross violation of human rights, uh, according to our national law, uh, national law number 26 uh, on uh, human rights uh, code, yeah? uh, gross violation of human rights, there are two in Indonesia. One is uh, crimes against humanity and another one is uh, genocide. So, uh, uh, violation of you uh, workers in uh, plantation uh, domestically in Indonesia cannot be defined as a gross violation of human rights. This is uh, human rights violations uh, as another violation of human rights. We have uh, six self-representative offices that we can ask them also to monitor in uh, uh, six different uh, uh, area, and also we have a very good link with university and also CSOs. Yeah. Well, CSOs mm -hmm. finally, uh, mostly they, they uh, uh, give us information or complain or sometimes they bring uh, the victims to come to our office in representative or to the uh, central office in Jakarta. So this is kind of uh, more or less the uh, mechanism that we have. Uh, we know that we need to strengthen our, our uh, authority also, but uh, Regarding the question, how the business uh, uh, comply with uh, with the, the uh, standard of human rights, I think this is questions uh, should be going to the government because they have they they, they are the one to have uh, authority yeah, to uh, pressure the, the business. Uh, mm. We have no uh, capacity or power to give. But, would you, but my question is, would you like to have more powers? Yes, we already raised the issue to the okay. parliament last year. Okay in order to review or revise mm -hmm. one article in national law on human rights okay. uh, uh, on, on the uh, legal uh, position okay. of, of NASA. Okay, that, that's very useful. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I, I would like to now pick a question from uh, Max Portler IOM. And that question is broadly about uh, what are the recommendations uh, from the NHRIs in relation to the, the plight of the migrant workers because of the COVID-19? Uh, and there are several other related questions around COVID and migrant workers that have been posed by the uh, participants. So I would like to ask both Mona and Kamal, uh, have you received such complaints about uh, migrant workers, COVID related migrant workers situations and whether your respective commissions have done anything about it? I will start with Mona first. Uh, Mona, if you can very briefly, because I have so many questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to um, uh, in detail. I'm just uh, highlighting a few things. Uh, 
as you all know, Human Rights Commission of Nepal is working very extensively during the COVID time as well. And um, in last uh, few years, we have a very good uh, mechanism as well, as I appreciate, uh, because I am involved in uh, developing a national inquiry guideline. We have a national inquiry guideline, which can inquire any issues, no matter women and children, uh, labor right, uh, environmental issue, any issue we can inquire. And then uh, uh, another in regard of the, your question, uh, but uh, I'm also seen in the box, uh, in a migrant worker issue, we have received uh, several online complaints. And okay. you know, we are crossing through pandemic situation and country is almost locked down. And uh, there is uh, like, uh, you know, uh, lack of lack of understanding of the migrant worker issue uh, 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 in, in, in uh, dealing with that issue, especially. For example, uh, government made a plan in a very earlier way to evacuate people from the Middle East, but uh, uh, it's a, it, it came on metrolizing very lately. Mm -hmm. And then another is uh, we have a huge number of migrant worker in India. You yes. know, have you watching those photos, uh, which is a uh, very disappointing to us. Uh, yeah. When people arrive from India, there is a very poor management from the both side, uh, both country. Like um, uh, I heard my foreign ministry has already committed that uh, both country have agreed that are going to be deal this issue collectively India and Nepal but uh, when we receive our migrant worker who lived in India they come just bluntly when the travel like a train and buses started in India and they arrive to the border uh, and uh, I think um, uh, some of them are like standing 72 hours some of them like standing on like uh, two days uh, children yeah. senior citizens um, women it's a, it's a uh, very, terrible, very, terrible uh, very terrible and heartbroken issues. Uh, sure. And we, we all are like, um, fail to manage that. Uh, I accept that, that very critically. We have uh, in our control, we issues some, uh, some directive to the government. Uh, mm. Our one of the migrant focal commissioner continuously meeting with the um, uh, um, labor authorities, uh, foreign, uh, a foreign ministry and the minister who is uh, accountable to deal with the COVID. And uh, laterly, they, I mean, to, they finally uh, evacuated people from the border side and they kept in this um, uh, quarantine, but uh, you know, the quarantine uh, is uh, not uh, followed by WHO standard. If you, if you go to see the Nepal's quarantine situation, it's a terrible, again, telling yeah. the terrible, it's not okay. fulfilling basic need of the health, yeah. basic need of the people. So it's a, it's a very disappointing. And I'm just uh, jumping on the question. Uh, there is a many questions just yeah, want to questions, address. Yes. Yeah, many questions. I just want to answer the one question, especially on an uh, indigenous issue. Again, I'm going yeah. to touch this issue. Government has already uh, declared and accepted the Treaty 169, ILO 169, and it committed to fully apply, fully apply on the um, legal uh, legal reform in the country. But it's uh, sad that uh, since the uh, past uh, few years, uh, ILO 169 is not respected to, uh, when uh, when government is uh, launching any kind of uh, mega projects. Uh, their major concern as a indigenous community has a major concern, like a right to land, right to participation, right to prior inform, and right to self-determination, uh, right to development. These are not uh, like um, respected uh, dealing with a uh, uh, dealing with uh, any new mega project. Uh, sure. Currently, one the, one debate is ongoing in Nepal. is a is a one a big big debate, especially developing many international airport. One is uh, already in um, completed in a Pokhara. Mm -hmm. Another is going to be completed in a Siddharth. Uh, it's a Lumbini. Mm -hmm. We all know Lumbini. It is also international airport, and third one is in a process. It uh, it called Nizgarh Airport, and mm -hmm. which is going to be like uh, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, and it, 
I don't know is uh, going to be like uh, affecting the very badly to uh, environment. People are yeah. going to huge number of people are going to uh, displace from that. People, some of reports says like eight zero point eight million tree is going to be cut down. Oh, that's a big number. Yeah. yeah, it's a big number, and uh, and I'm just imagining, uh, just trying to imagine how the situation is going to be create after that, and mm. it's a. So, so basically, uh, you're highlighting a range of challenges that your commission is facing, and and, and you can't really <laughs> handle everything, right? I know. I mean, it's a so many issues, so many, so issues, many yes. issues, yeah, yeah. and um, uh, I know it's um, we have a lot of expertise, but sometimes it's a lack of expertise lack of also capacity. is a uh, capacity expertise yes. also okay. creating a challenge for us. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank if you. I may uh, <laughs> stop you here for now. Uh, Dr. Kamal, I would like to move on to you now. And uh, same question for you, migrant workers, COVID situation, if you have would like to share anything very briefly. I would also like to add one more question for you. Uh, if you have any experience or suggestion in terms of how NHRIs can collaborate together. Like we have Asia Pacific Forum of NHRIs, we have Gandhi. So how can NHRIs work together uh, to collaborate together to deal with some of the challenges? Uh, that is a question for you. And so that you have some time to think about this question, I pose two questions for Amara and then you have time to answer those questions as well after Kamal. So I, I, I read the questions for you, Amara, now. Uh, first question for Amara for you is that uh, whether ASEAN NHRI, whether ICHAR has any plans to set up any central system to handle grievances for ASEAN countries? That's first question. The second question is a bit provocative and you can decide whether you want to answer that question, but I will still read this question. The question is that which of the 10 ASEAN countries in your view would be prepared to support the creation of a regional human rights court? So the two questions for you, you can think about it. And now I uh, give the floor to uh, Dr. Kamal. So Kamal, uh, if you can very briefly address those two questions, COVID one and the second one, the regional networks of NHRIs. And then I will come to Andy, thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. Surya. Uh, at first, about the COVID situation and migrant workers that you have mentioned, I would say that we have taken a Suomoto stance for this particular thing, and we have been observing since the beginning of the lockdown situation. We found that um, expatriates, expatriate workers have been returning from outside countries because of the reason that some countries uh, were trying to deport them, which was really quite unfortunate. We know that UN provision is there that during crisis situation, uh, the job cannot be cut or someone uh, cannot be deported, uh, as I know. So uh, we have been from our expatriate welfare ministry and our uh, foreign ministry, we have been trying to contact those countries, especially eight countries, mainly in the Middle Eastern region. And uh, this is one of the things that we have been trying to do, uh, uh, Suomoto. And another thing that uh, we found that those expatriate uh, ex uh, uh, workers, when coming back to the country, they were taken to quarantine. They were in quarantine, but still when they came to the society, uh, uh, it was somehow or other well, um, uh, took by people that uh, they were spreading uh, COVID amongst people. That's why there is a social stigma about which we were really, uh, I mean, uh, we stood beside these people. We talked to uh, journalists. We tried to make it, uh, I mean, uh, known to people that uh, these people are not to be uh, put to any kind of stigma. They are all our brothers, sisters, and they are coming to the country. They have been in uh, quarantine. So, it's not that they would be, uh, they are spreading. So that was one of the problems that we have been facing and uh, we were trying to address those from uh, our human rights institution, Suomoto. About, uh, uh, should I say about indigenous people? That was a question uh, in general. Yeah, yeah, but very briefly, please, yes. About indigenous people, we definitely are very much proactive about that. We look after a situation like equal employment opportunity and the, acceptance of diversity in business organization. 
so that people coming from the uh, from the hill track areas should not by any means be discriminated because of the fact that they belong to those communities. So that is one of the things. And uh, access to uh, effective uh, rem uh, remedy, uh, there was a question, uh, a flag question. I would say that we have been trying to develop awareness amongst people, especially about human rights defenders, civil society organizations. We have been trying to organize and uh, organize training sessions. Number of trainings have been conducted by our United Nations Human Rights uh, 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 project, HRP. Uh, they have been contributing a lot for this, and that's why we have been able to develop awareness amongst the human rights defenders. Lastly, about the collaboration that you have mentioned, especially amongst NHRAs. I really put, our, from our uh, institution, we put much emphasis on this. We, we feel that there should be a good collaboration amongst all the human rights institutions, regionally and internationally also, so that we can look eye to eye, we can see the problems, especially contextual problems that we can share views and uh, ideas amongst us. We can sign uh, MOUs amongst us or between us so that we can help each other, we can share ideas, talk with them, uh, uh, with all other NHRIs. So that would really help us uh, sharing and caring uh, and yeah. really knowing each other would be really helping us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for being brief and, and tackling several questions. Uh, now I would like to give floor to Amara, but before you have the floor, I would like to flag a couple of questions for Andy so that you have time to think about your response. Uh, one question that I would like to direct you to Andy is this, that uh, uh, there are these situations where there's this perception at least that the NHRI is uh, there is corruption uh, or there is some intervention politically or some motivation and they're not independent basically. They're not acting uh, in those particular cases independently. There, there's one question coming from, I think, Tahuddi uh, al-Islam Jodri. So I would like you to reflect on that question. The second question that I would like you to consider is uh, coming from Anita Sinha. Uh, that question is... Uh, coming about uh, remedy for, again, migrant workers. Let us say uh, a private company says that we have no money to compensate this particular migrant worker. W what could NHRA do? Can you think about, based on your experience of dealing with migrant worker situation, you know, what should be the remedy in those cases where a company is there, but the company says, oh, we have nothing, we have nothing left. So we can't really compensate this. And the third question, if anything, you would like to add about uh, your lessons from the uh, Tamakasa case, Tamakasa case, you know, what would you have liked the NHRC Thailand to do differently? Let us say there is another case in future, right? Or any other peer NHRI. So three questions, you think about it. Uh, Amara, you have the floor now. Uh, thank you, Sriya. The first question on Aisha's plan to set up grievance mechanism. Uh, yes, some of us uh, are trying to set up grievance mechanism, but it has not been easy. Uh, my idea is that ICHA and NHRIs in the region should work closely together and collaborate in, in all aspects because uh, NHRIs have strong structure and very clear mandate. They also have budget, etc. So if AICHA can work with individuals and in HRIs and CSOs in the region, uh, we can uh, plan or design grievance mechanism, which may link or overlap. Uh, you don't need to be uh, separating in HRIs and AICHA, but we see them as collaborating and working together. Uh, but this will not happen in the near future, I don't think. <laughs> Sorry to say that. But we are trying uh, to set up some grievance mechanism. At the moment, there had been many uh, complaints coming into ASEC, and they had been keeping them uh, in the drawers without, uh, you know, don't know what to do. But we have agreed now that we will acknowledge that those complaints came in and then we'll transfer the, 
the complaints to relevant uh, NHRIs or uh, similar organization in cases in countries where there is no NHRI. So yes, we are working on setting up grievance mechanism, but we don't know when we'll get there. The second question on regional human rights court. Again, um, even with the, the regular complaints and grievance mechanism, it had been difficult to handle. And I don't see, your, your question was, uh, is, is there any- Which country, country may be supporting? Which uh, out of 10 countries? I don't see any, <laughs> <laughs> but- uh, Oh, Indonesia there... we support? I, I see the uh, Tofan raising a finger, su suggesting okay. that Indonesia may be supporting. Anyway, but let's my, see. My comment here is that uh, if uh, people file cases to court, yeah. In, in this case, human rights court. You have to treat the cases on the individual basis. Don't tie to nationalities. So yeah. if you and I have cases in court, it's Ria and Amara, yeah. and it's not India and Thailand. Yeah. So we have to, to make clear that you, we keep nationality out of the- Depoliticize, the depoliticize the cases. Huh? Yes. Yes, and treat them as two people having conflict and need to have some resolution. Yeah, good suggestion, very good suggestion. Thank you so much. Uh, Andy, if I may move to you now, uh, big questions for you. Uh, if you can briefly respond, uh, thank you so much in advance. Okay, uh, related to independence, you know, the National Human yeah. Rights Commissions, um, you know, they need to be fair, they need to be transparent, they need to be easily accessible, you know, they shouldn't be politicized. And I think I don't want to talk about individual countries. Um, because actually many, I'm That's not, fine. it's not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not in the corridors of power in many ways, but there are huge suspicions about um, the involvement of uh, business, um, military, um, other vested interests in, in the actings of national human rights commissions uh, across the region and across the world. Uh, they should be democratic, you know, processes. They should be resourced, you know, well resourced. So I think that's a, a real challenge. And, and uh, I think that, you know, the national human rights commissions, they need to protect the complainants, you know, like it's not a court, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a an institution that is specializing in human rights, you know, in, in the world, we have many uh, theories, we have many means of dialogue, you know, we have a business perspective, we have a political perspective, we have a human rights perspective, we have an economic environmental perspective, whatever, this should be focusing on human rights, there should be human rights experts or people who know about human rights issues that they're dealing with. And in a way, this should be a mechanism which prioritizes, um, even promotes the, the people who are complaining, you know, these are people who the power imbalance between business and between workers and communities and those impact is huge and it's getting bigger every day. And so the National Human Rights Commission should be an institution that empowers individuals in incredibly difficult circumstances, almost like a bias towards them in favor of them, reverse discrimination, whatever you want to call it, you know, that actually helps to promote the issue of, uh, because the, the power imbalance is so great. Um, and, you know, these institutions need to be resourced, you know, um, and there needs to be specialists on, on, on the subject. Um, and these need to be institutions that can promote negotiation, you know, as a human rights defender, a former human rights defender, a current human rights defender, I don't know. We're also not specialists in business or economics or whatever. We have a passion for the work we do and we try to promote the, work, the rights of workers. We're often not the best people to negotiate. We often don't consider political issues. We don't consider environment, uh, economic issues. And so national human rights commissions can come and help people to negotiate, you know, help communities. Maybe they cannot speak the native language. Maybe they don't even feel comfortable in the, in the room in the National Human Rights Commission, which is this lofty building. These are people from villages, from, you know, from, from rural communities, you know, um, and the National Human Rights Commission can give them a voice and they should be helping to promote negotiations between people who are coming from very different uh, viewpoints, you know, helping activists, helping communities to understand business, helping business to understand communities. And, and that's a role which the National Human Rights Commission should play. Um, I think on the issue of migrant workers, I mean, 
it's yeah i mean i i just want to say you know this is i i know i spoke to mona you know this is just heartbreaking what's happening in nepal now um, Nepal is on the verge of a humanitarian crisis, without a doubt, from the workers that are returning from India who are bringing COVID-19 with the centers, the quarantine centers that are not up to standard. Um, we have countries in the Middle East refusing to do COVID-19 tests on people before they repatriate them. We have, and this is a failure of the business and human rights framework. These migrant workers migrated to work. They migrated to do things in the business perspective and the businesses are not responding for them. You know, they're not paying for their fares. They're not supporting them. And, and countries like Nepal are going to be decimated by what's happening in, 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 in this issue. And I really, my heart goes out to seeing the, the pictures on the Nepal-India border and, and, and knowing what's going to happen in the coming weeks when people start coming back from the Middle East. You know, China, England, the US, they couldn't control people who were returning. And then we have uh, the World Health Organization organization, the ILO, the IOM, these organizations, what are they doing to support Nepal to, to get through this crisis? I, I don't see it. Um, and it's really concerning. And I mean, and, and finally, you know, what are the, the lessons learned, you know, I think national human rights commissions, they need to have a clear understanding of international law, international human rights law, they need to be ahead of the government, they need to be ahead of the, they need to be the ones protecting human rights. Um, and they need to, you know, they need to understand what is the definition of forced labor. They need to understand what is business human rights. And they need to understand that in practice. I mean, the Tamagasek case was a, a sad case, you know, and it's something which it almost goes against the grain of many positive things that are happening in Thailand and it carries on. Um, so we need protection of the victims. You know, we need specialists, we need independent people, we need well-resourced um, people. And, you know, you talked about, you know, if the worker doesn't have any means to get compensation. The National Human Rights Commissioners, they need to be aware of supply chain issues also. Maybe a small company can't help, you know, but maybe their buyer can help. Maybe the brands can help. Um, you know, the means to help the workers to get resources, you know, and, and that maybe won't be 100% compensation, but maybe it will be a large amount of compensation. I think the National Human Rights Commission it needs to be a down to earth institution. It needs to be an institution that really helps those in need, those that don't have a voice, those that are not familiar with judicial mechanisms and it needs to help them in a way that's practical bring about negotiation and help people to get real remedies you know and and, and the Tamagasek case was the complete opposite of that um, and it's a really it's a really sad stain on so many things that are, that are happening for the positive in, in Thai society so thank you Andy uh, and uh, th there are so many questions and let me see if I could get more uh, but I would also like to share very quickly some of the findings uh, that the working group discovered based on our project on NHRIs globally and they may be relevant for Asia Pacific as well uh, in terms of challenges, the four issues came out. First, uh, many HRIs do not have an explicit mandate to accept complaints about uh, BHR cases, or they do not have the powers to enforce. Uh, uh, they do not have the powers to enforce their uh, orders. That's first. Second, there is a limited capacity. Capacity could be about their lack of awareness about BHR standards, something that Andy just mentioned, or it could be lack of resources. People are not, staff is not there. They do not have enough financial resources and all this. The third issue that came out is the autonomy or the lack of it, lack of autonomy and independence of uh, NHRIs. And I had uh, a consultation with the civil society organizations on 29th of May, Asia Pacific. And one issue that came out is that many NHRIs, even with A status, do not have independence in the eyes of the users. And I think that is very worrying. So if the NHRIs have the A status and the users of NHRIs do not consider them to be independent, I think something is missing there. And the fourth challenge is in terms of uh, the asymmetry of power, uh, which, which again, Andy mentioned that how do they protect uh, civic space and uh, protect human rights defenders? And I think in terms of those challenges, we also have some recommendations going forward in our report. And I think one of the recommendations that uh, our report is going to have is that the NHRI should collaborate with other institutions, other NHRIs, but also it could be national contact points uh, under the OECD guidelines. And in this context, now I would like to bring in a short video uh, so, Hermes, if you can get the video ready, and this video is from Professor Christine Kaufman. She is a chairperson of the Responsible Business Conduct, uh, OECD Responsible Business Conduct Party, 
and she has a short video for us in terms of the relation of NHRIs and national contact points. And after that video, uh, hopefully we still have a couple of minutes and I will go back to all the panelists again uh, with, with final reflections. Thank you. Hermes, uh, if you can play the video, please. As the chair of the OECD Working Party on Responsible Business Conduct, I would like to focus on three areas where OECD national contact points and national human rights institutions can benefit from working together in the area of responsible business conduct. My first point is policy coherence. Today, the COVID-19 crisis emphasizes the need for policy coherence. It is critical that business-related human rights impacts are addressed in policy responses to COVID-19 with a view to make the recovery sustainable and work yeah, for all. So, and who I'm else sorry. would be better placed than national human rights institutions and OECD national contact points to bring responsible business considerations into these discussions? Let me move to my second point point, which is promotion and capacity building. We already have an instrument. It's the OECD Memorandum of Understanding concluded with the Association of National Human Rights Institutions in 2017. It's about knowledge sharing and capacity building between national contact points and national human rights institutions. All we need to do is to bring this existing instrument to life. For example, in addressing and in analyzing the impacts of COVID-19. Let me move to my third point, which is addressing grievances. The OECD guidelines are the only international comprehensive standard on responsible business conduct that comes with a grievance mechanism. And national human rights institutions, some of them, also have a grievance function. Since most of the cases that national, human, national contact points received are about human rights, national contact points can benefit from the experience and expertise of national human rights institutions in human rights and vice versa. National human rights institutions may wish to draw on the expertise of NCPs with regard to the business-related aspects of a case. Let me conclude. The world is facing a pandemic with unprecedented economic, human rights and social impacts. This is the time to bring the power of national contact points and national human rights institutions acting jointly to life. I call on governments to include and to systematically include responsible business conduct into all COVID-19 policy responses and recovery packages. I call on governments to involve national human rights institutions and national contact points in these discussions. It is critical for these discussions with a view to sustainable recovery. And I call on national contact points and national human rights institutions to join forces to mainstream human rights and responsible business conduct into policy responses and recovery packages. Use your power, speak up and speak for those who will otherwise not be heard to make the recovery sustainable and work for all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christine. Uh, you may not hear me, but I would like to thank you for your message. Uh, and I think that message is well received. And this will be one of our recommendations of the working group report that the NHRIs have to join forces. They have to work with other NHRIs. They have to work with other regional institutions. They have to work with the global institutions. And they have to work with uh, courts as well as national contact points to achieve these goals, which, which, and today we are focusing only on one broad goal, which is facilitating access to effective remedy, but there are mother, many other roles which the NHRIs can play in this particular context. I would also like to uh, read a couple of more questions. And there's one question, um, I, we don't have anyone from Indian NHRI, but there is a question or a comment and plus question from Lara Jasani. And she's talking about uh, National Human Rights Commission of India being very inactive. Uh, to deal with this COVID crisis uh, and the related situations. And then I think her question is perhaps uh, other NHRIs who are on the panel could reflect on it. Or if there is anyone listening from NHRC India, uh, please uh, put uh, the answer in the chat box. So if you would like to take the floor, uh, let me know. Uh, and her question is basically that uh, 
what what other lessons we have from the other other countries to control basically the government and the companies how could nhris hold the government accountable and we have covid crisis we have uh, a situation in which the governments are using their emergency powers we have a situation in which uh, the government is trying to go after civil society actors and human rights defenders so i think that is a broad question i have for all of you and i would give only one minute to each of you and that will be your concluding thoughts as well uh, who would like to start first all five of you have one minute each to answer this question what should happen in terms of lessons recommendations for nhis how could they hold governments companies accountable what is your wish list what would you like to have mr kamal i think you are ready it seems who is ready yeah uh, oh okay tofan so, tofan is ready okay tofan you go ahead because, because in the case of indonesia uh, the issue is not about the uh, independence of national human rights commissions Okay. We are very independent according to our national law, but the problem is, as, as Andy Hall said, the imbalance uh, power between uh, complainant and uh, the business. So okay. that's why in many mediation that we have, uh, the position of the the, the victims uh, they are very weak. Needs it means that we need to uh, uh, review. Yeah, we already raised the issue of uh, reviewing or amend amendment of uh, some regulation. Or some national law on mining, for example, on plantation, even on land, because uh, most of the conflict is about the land uh, or uh, natural resources between entities or business and uh, and people. Yes. And in fact, in fact, there is a question about palm oil, and I did not have time. So you are absolutely right. There, there are yes, questions and about and land and conflict. And all regulation is more pro capital than more pro people. That's mm -hmm. a the the. the the, the main issue that we need to uh, uh, discuss uh, later uh, in order to uh, review the legal or reform the legal uh, uh, aspect of uh, uh, business and human rights. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mona, would you like to go now? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I think uh, my wish list, when uh, something like uh, very challenging and this uh, COVID is going to challenge the world. And Nepal is also one of the affected countries. So my wish list, this is a time that Nepal should uh, put uh, their effort again uh, and uh, committed uh, for human right, committed as always, they, they show their commitment. But this time is to uh, look at back and this pandemic is uh, giving a two way. One is the challenge, of course, we are losing so many things, but it's also giving opportunity, opportunity, lot of opportunity. We are receiving our trained people back in Nepal. So how to transform, how to, how to use their knowledge, for example, migrant worker, how to use their knowledge in a local development, how to use their expertise in developing maybe agriculture, they have learned so many technical advanced mechanism, for example, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, uh, they, they make a green in uh, 20 years, they make a green. This is a huge number of Nepali worker. So my wish list, uh, government must be accountable on fundamental human right. Okay. That, that's a good way to end. Uh, thank you so much, Mona. Uh, Dr. Kamal, you have the floor now. Very briefly, any final thoughts about my question or anything you want to say now? Mm, Dr. Kamal, can you hear me? I would give the floor to uh, Professor Amara to save time because Dr. Kamal perhaps is unable to speak. Amara, you No, no, I can't speak. Okay. I can speak. Okay, then please go ahead, Dr. Kamal. Oh, yes. Very briefly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so if you want, to, want me to tell about the wish list. One minute. I will but... first say that. Okay, our NHRC would be, uh, would be very glad to uh, play a key role in ensuring 
that the companies respect their human rights responsibilities. Here, we want that uh, NHRC should not only take up complaints uh, of corporate violations of human rights, but also build the capacity of the affected community to seek redress and develop tools to assist companies to comply with their human rights responsibilities. This is our great expectation. We Very want good. to advocate, advocate in incorporating business and human rights issues in all relevant plans and programs, making it as a priority issue uh, and study research are to be conducted uh, and then strengthen capa its capacity regard to, in regard to dealing with businesses and human rights issues. We would be very glad if we could organize a number of meetings, seminars, workshops with our stakeholders very regularly. That would be very good. Thank you very much. I mean, that's very ambitious. I mean, so I wish this, these these things come true. Uh, Professor Amara, very briefly, we are about to run out of time, but one minute each, uh, you and Andy. This is for NHRIs, right? Uh, uh, I, you can talk about IHR also, it's up to you. Your call. <laughs> I think both NHRIs and Aisha should take complaints seriously and have an open uh, heart to collaborate with partners, uh, other NHRIs or CSOs. And what I would like to see developed in the next year is to ask corporate firms to respect and carry out human rights due diligence fully and observe uh, that. Very good, very, very precise recommendation. Thank you so much. Uh, Andy, you have the final words. Very quickly, uh, please. The National Human Rights Institution should protect the victims and the complainants, whether that requires legal amendment or in practice, it's very important. Human rights institutions need to, the, the commissioners, the, the, the people need to have an understanding of human rights, the understanding of human rights defenders, the understandings of the realities of the communities, of the workers, of the affected people. There needs to be a strong negotiation capacity whereby informally and effectively they can ensure remedy because remedy is often the thing that is missing. We don't need discussions, we don't need legal reform, often just we need remedy for the victims. Um, they should play a role in supporting and empowering and addressing the balance of power deficit, you know, the balance of power deficit that we have between business and workers. This is undeniable and it's growing around the world. Uh, especially in the area of business human rights. And, and as the, the video said, you know, they need to use their power. They need to speak up. We often see on the front page of the newspaper in Nepal, the National Human Rights Commission giving a statement every day on some issue. And National Human Rights Commissioners need to speak up. They need to be active. Um, and they need to really focus on making that issue of human rights, which is just one area of life, um, to be a focal point and to be something that is discussed publicly and widely uh, okay. to really benefit the victims. Okay, that, that's a very, good, a very good way to end the session that the NHRIs must stand up for CSOs and human rights defenders, and they should stand for the protection of human rights. So with this, I would like to close this webinar. I would like to thank all the panelists for their contributions and time. I would also like to thank all the participants uh, who have been listening to this webinar, all the questions and comments. My apologies, I could not take all the questions. Uh, but please uh, remain connected about this issue. Uh, keep an eye uh, out about our report, uh, working group report on NHRIs, and feel free to email me if you would like any further information. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye, thank and you. enjoy the rest of the session in the forum. And also, thank you to Insight Pact for, for coordinating this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Yeah. Matikan aja kameranya. Ya. Yeah.